and I've just started the recording now. So we will share this session on YouTube afterwards and it will be made publicly available. So just please remember anything you do will be captured on that and then shared with everybody. It's nice to see some of you back today. I appreciate this is a really busy term and it's hard to find the time to get out. If anybody's joining us afterwards, everything that we're doing today will be fully recorded and all the resources will be available in a slide deck in the team afterwards. So you'll be able to pick up everything as if you were here. The reason for today's session, it wasn't planned originally, is that Microsoft have decided in their wisdom to update the application process. Uh, in, it was only a day before the application process went live on May the 6th that we were informed that things were going to be changed slightly. So we today thought we need to put on an additional session to make you really clear about how to compile your application. What we've been doing with you previously around the four old questions is not wasted because a lot of the evidence that you've been collecting for those can be transferred over into the new format. However, you need to understand how those questions are now broken up and pitched. And we're going to today focus on that. So some of it will be familiar and other bits are going to be completely new. The course outcomes that we set out at the very beginning are still as applicable as ever, and they are underpinned by everything in the new MIE application process. So we do want to make classrooms accessible, that learning engaging for pupils and students and focusing on reducing teacher workloads. So the application process itself is going to run in a slightly different way, but not radically different. Step one is still the same as it always has been, and that was to go to the Microsoft Education Center or the MEC and create yourself a profile, which I think everybody here has already done, and then undertake some independent CPD to get a thousand points, which is usually a couple of beginners courses at about 500 points each. We've also given you some codes in previous sessions. So if you're listening to this today and you're thinking, don't have a lot of time to do that, you can jump into the team. And I think it was session three where I gave away a code. So that code's there as well if you need to go and pick it up. And then you could redeem that to get your thousand points because we want to help you cut down workloads. And it's step three that changed radically uh, from the 5th of May into the 6th of May. And that's why we are running this session today. If any of you haven't gone to the Microsoft Education Center, it looks a little bit like the screenshot we have there and you simply sign in, in the top corner and either redeem that code or start to plan the courses that you're interested in. Or it might be a series of courses in a learning pathway that will get you the first qualification on the left hand side of the screen, which is to become a certified MIE. And then you will fill out your application to become an MIE -E, and that may well lead you as a digital leader in your school to start to bring about change and transformation where you think about becoming a showcase school and you join what's called the incubator process and that's something turn it on will be offering at the other end of the summer holidays and we'll be running an incubator school showcase program and we'll work with you throughout the autumn term if that's something you're interested in joining keep your eyes out keep checking the events section of the turn it on website so we'll now dip into the revised updated version of the MIEE application process and how it now looks different in the 2020-21. So you have a document and it's a Word document and it's called the self-nomination and evidence document. This is now a formalized version of what we were guiding you towards previously. We spoke about creating a Word document, keeping a OneNote class notebook or a OneNote and capturing the ideas for everything that we've covered in all those previous MIEE sessions to have them there to originally put in your Sway application. Well, the Sway application has gone and the video has gone and there's a new portal that you create an account for and we'll show you that that you then go on and you answer some questions. And the MIEE self-nomination evidence document is used so that you can go and structure your application. Now, if I swap screens a moment, I will show you what that looks like. The links to get to this document are included in the slide deck, we'll pop into the team afterwards. But the form is very, very straightforward. It explains in great detail here exactly what the new phases are in step three. 
and then it will take you through those phases. And we are also going to do that in today's session. So that document's freely available. It's online if you've already found it. It has had a couple of updates. So if you downloaded the version even last week, it's been changed again since then. But Microsoft assure me they won't tinker with it too much more. It's just where they find uh, inaccuracies in the wordings or things that are slightly confusing, they've updated them for you. So to make sure that it's as clear as possible, but that's also why we're running sessions like this. So let's just walk back over to the slide deck. Once you've got that document, phase one of that document focuses on information about you. Then phase two will be around the tools that you've got in Microsoft 365, all of those tools that we've been looking at across the different MIEE sessions we've had previously. Whereas phase one is about you and it has no impact on your nomination and your application to become an MIEE, phase two does. And it's marked by AI. In fact, we've got machine learning in the background and it's picking up our correct answers or variations of correct answers. And you need to get 70 percent or higher to get through phase two. If you don't, we'll explain what happens in just a moment. But you need to make sure that you are prepared for those questions and we'll have a look at some of those in a little bit. In phase three, the long form questions are reviewed by a human being. They're read by the panel, the same panel that would have previously had a look at Sway applications or videos. And you need to have got through phase two for your phase three long answer questions to be considered. If you get your nomination in early on July the 8th and you happen to have not answered what they call phase one. Now, it's really confusing because what they mean are the answers that you're going to put into phase two. If you haven't answered those correctly, you didn't get the 70% required. If you put it in on July the 8th, they'll put it through the AI marking process. And if you come up short, say 60%, they will then get in contact with you via your email address and they'll let you know and they'll give you from July the 8th to July the 15th to go back and revisit the answers that you gave in phase two and correct them so that they would then move on and consider phase three. They'll only do that once. So if you know that you are someone who's not quite sure whether you've got the 70 percent pass rate required in the phase two answers, it's worth getting in your nomination form early in your online portal on July the 8th. And then they will give you that benefit of doubt and they will come in and they will help you with it. So if we looked at all the way back now to the phase one questions, the questions about you, they look a little bit like the screenshot down in the corner. You can make as many notes as you want on the Word document, but it's really, really simple. And there's a very high correlation of the questions on the Word document, which is your self-nomination form, and the final portal where you will put your answers. So I have found it and I've gone through and I've attempted it. I found that if you put the answers into the Word document, you can pretty much cut and paste into the online portal and bring it all across. And it is worth investing the time to do the Word document because you've done all the hard work and all you need to do is move it over. Phase one questions, as it suggests, is just getting some background about you as an individual, understanding your habits, how active you are. It will also want you to explain the digital tools, that's the softwares, the Microsoft 365 applications you've used, either individually for you in your own classroom or maybe with the wider school community if you've got a role where you're trying to bring about digital transformation. We'll also in the phase one se section about you, you're going to need to discuss other technology and communities that you're involved in. Microsoft understand that you aren't exclusively going to be using only Microsoft products. They'd like to know a bit more about other platforms that you use, the software that you use, maybe apps on tablet devices. But additionally, if you are quite active within other communities, education communities, they'd also like to know that they're looking for people that are interested in networking, making connections to help themselves, but also to help others. So they're really interested in your connections there. And that section there, just to reiterate, is just to get that better understanding of you as an individual. And it has no bearing on the rest of your application and it won't be considered in any way at all 
for any of the phase two or phase three questions. So do answer it truthfully. You haven't got to hide anything. Uh, it's just, as I said, to get that background of you. Any questions on the phase one section of the new part of the self-nomination form? Anyone want to ask anything, anything at the moment that you've got questions around that? If there isn't, I will just continue on into phase two. As I said, you're always welcome to ask anything. Mark, I could just see you typing a question there, so I'll just wait for you to pop that in. While we're waiting for Mark to come up, the form itself, as I said, has had a number of updates. The version that's there now shouldn't change, but it is always worth just going and checking it before you put in your final application. Anything that's changed, they tend to highlight in a colour. Um, Mark, that's that's absolutely fine. If you did find it easy to go straight to the online version, you can. I um, mean, Microsoft made this form, this Microsoft form available so that you could structure it pre that. But if you're someone who just wants to go in there, you can save your application and come back to it. It's not a, a one chance only and you have to get it all in in one go. If you want to go directly to it, then by all means go into there as well. Phase two in the form these are the scored questions the ones that are are marked by machine learning so this is where it links to your cpd completed in the mech the microsoft education center it wants to know about the courses that you've attempted or the or the learning pathways that you've undertaken they are quantitative questions and they will focus on your pedagogical use of microsoft tools and applications They'll also delve into the features that you've used in those applications and the impact that it's had. And those responses are not looked at by a human being. It has a range of answers that it will accept. So variations, even misspellings are taken into consideration, but you need to focus specifically on the questions being asked with the response that you should be giving. I'm just gonna change over and have a look at that in the form itself for a moment. And uh, swap screens for you. All right, let's move over to the Word document. So if we went down to phase two, it's not set out strictly the same in the online versions. Mark will uh, will have found out, but on the Word document, they've they've created grids for you to fill in. So it explains the scoring here. Um, it also explains the courses that you've completed or ask you about the courses you've completed. It might ask you about transcripts that you've got. And then, for instance, here it goes through different applications in Microsoft 365, asks you very, very, very briefly there about frequency of use of those different applications. Be honest when you put it in, hopefully by now, the fact that you're here on the MIEE course, you've used them more than once, but Microsoft understand that you're going to be using a range of technologies and you might not be using everything all the time. It then will look at wider technologies or wider courses and support mechanisms that Microsoft have, like Make Co for the computing curriculum, might be hacking STEM if you're involved in any of the STEM subjects, or it might be that you've used a, a course or a resource on the Microsoft Imagination, Imagine Academy even. Then it will ask, things like the accessibility tools that we've we focused on in PowerPoint have used things like live presentations, recordings, captionings, and then into the immersive readers and the, all those tools that are there. It will ask you about other associated technologies such as Flipgrid, which we've considered in some of the previous MIE sessions. You just need to go through and either directly put your answers in as Mark's done into the portal or record them here in the Microsoft form. In, it's your preference as to which one you do. That section isn't too long uh, and to get 70% didn't seem too onerous. You just had to make sure that you filled everything in, gave an answer that was clear and that it could be picked up by the automatic marking system that Microsoft are using in the back end. Any questions on the phase two at all or anybody got any insights if they've had a go at answering any of the phase two questions they want to share with anybody that's here? OK, there isn't. I will keep moving. So we'll move on to phase three next and phase three of the long questions. And I'm going to break down each of the questions so you've got a clearer understanding 
of how you should be answering them, the sort of areas that you should be covering, the level of depth that should be included. So the first thing I want to say is that these questions, a bit like uh, an exam syllabus or if you're working at uni, they've got to set character limits. So you need to have a minimum of 500 characters and a maximum of 2,000 characters in your explanations for these long answers questions. You need to really clearly illustrate how you've used the Microsoft tools and how they've been incorporated into your own professional practice, but how you have then branched out and used them with other colleagues. It might be you've just helped somebody in a neighbouring classroom. It might be somebody else in the same subject or educational phase. However you've done it, it doesn't matter, but do make sure that you talk about others as well as yourself. It's really key and part of the MIEE mindset is that you are building that community, you're building and driving that change and part of the change management and digital transformations that you're working through or with others. And that needs to come across really clearly in particularly the phase three questions. And th those, as I said, are all then assessed by a human being. So they will be read and they will be something that if you haven't covered certain areas that they're looking for, that you will get dismissed quite quickly. So part of going through the application process with you today is to make sure there is absolute clarity over what should be included. So we'll now go through each of the questions that are on the form. So rather than going back over to the Word document or going to the live portal, we will go through the form itself. So in question one, I want to be very clear, if you have not been an MIEE previously, you skip question one. If you have been that, you need to include question one. So make sure that you go through and you talk about how you've worked previously as being an MIEE. It's an either or, but it's there on the form. And I don't believe on the online portal they've changed it. Though one of the things that we fed back is it was almost branching. And if you ticked a box to say you were at previous MIE status, it either did or didn't show you question one. Uh, and then you flow through the rest of the questions from it there. I haven't been back on in the last week, but certainly just before half term in the UK, that hadn't been implemented. But we were hoping it was going to be one of the things that they were going to implement. If you are going to be answering question one, there's some examples there of the sort of areas that they expect you to be talking about. So regardless of whether you were previously an MIEE or whether you are applying to be an MIEE for the first time, you now have to reapply annually. That was one of the changes that came about with this new application system. And that's why question one is there. And if you're coming back as a previous MIEE, Microsoft want to know about the impact you've had in the previous months or years uh, and what you've been doing. They'll want to know about how active you've been in the virtual events that have run this year. So we, we spoke to you and we've put into the team about events such as E2. And there's been a showcase virtual summit we had with Downhouse School that you could uh, come and attend previously. And that was part of this program. So there have been lots of opportunities to expose you to those sort of things, even though you may have not been a previous MIEE, but also so that you can start to make those links and sort of think about the expectations that Microsoft will have of you when you become an MIEE. I'm going to move on to question two because I appreciate that's not relevant to everybody that's here on the call today or if you're watching this afterwards. So question two is going to be around how you've used those Microsoft tools to increase accessibility to learning. Now, we had an entire session on that with the Turn It On course, but it's something that Microsoft are passionate about is levelling the playing fields and using the tools you have at your disposal. You could be talking about that in terms of educator or learners. And I know that a few of you have asked me questions in the past. Well, what does Microsoft define as an educator or a learner? So we've now got a description of that in there below on the slide. And I know also that some of the people that are here today don't work with pupils and students. They work with other people that are adults. That's absolutely fine. And if you find yourself in that context, make sure you just explain that and you give some sort of context to your answers. But Microsoft understand that you might want to be an MIEE and not work with children or not work with young adults. And that is something that's fine and it won't go against you in your application. In fact, it could be celebrated just as equally as working with pupils and students. But just make sure you've explained that and given it context and grounding. Examples then 
of areas that you have to include in your answer to question two. Make sure you labour your use of immersive reader. We've used it a few times, used it in team session. We certainly used it on the accessibility tools session. Talk about how you've used those three tab tabs in the top right hand corner of immersive reader for text and for grammar. Uh, and show how you've used them to increase accessibility of resources. Also, it might be things like the accessibility checker that's built into Office apps for the online web apps, particularly PowerPoint and also Word. We briefly had a look at those on a slide in one of our accessibility sessions. And then the live captions, I showed you them on Teams. No, sorry, I showed you them on PowerPoint, but they're also available on Teams. If you haven't found them yet on Teams, they seem to be switched on depending on the person who manages your tenancy, your Office 365 environment. But if you want to find those, you click the three dots on the meeting bar and very close to where start recording is, you'll have an option to show either the meeting captions, which will come up as subtitles underneath if they're enabled, or you can have a transcription where it gives you a recording and a word transcription of the Teams meeting afterwards. If you haven't had a go at those, you can easily just have a go with a member of staff and make sure that you've incorporated that in there as part of your answer. Is there anything about the question two section that you want to ask within the phase three? Mark, again, I can see you're busy typing there. The key there is accessibility, immersive reader. You have to talk about all the features of immersive reader, but other areas of the accessibility tools, the ones that we've explored and also the ones that I've got there on the slide at the moment. If you haven't had a go at them, certainly they don't take a long time to use. Switching on things like captions and PowerPoint, it's just a click of a button uh, and it could be something then you can illustrate. With these written, explanations and long answer questions whereas previously you could include screenshots in the sway you can no longer do that in the written form so you need to make sure that you've got it across very clearly in writing and you've captured there just how successfully you've used them and the impact i keep coming back to the impact with microsoft want to know the impact on either the educators or the learners it's fine for either it might be that you've shown the tool to a, a colleague and they've used it with their class and as an educator, you've had a, a transformation on the way that they teach and use that tool. So that's equally valid. Uh, Mark, I see you put something in there in the chat. Yep, that, that's perfectly valid. And in increasing accessibility for colleagues, or it could be parents, it could be governors. So I've, I've had a couple of people say, okay, I've got a couple of governors. They've struggled with accessibility to governor resources in school. All of that is valid. You can do it in many different ways. It could be trustees. If you work across an academy, it could be someone else you've linked with in another school. Uh, it's There's huge scope to get these in, and it doesn't matter how you do it. They just need to be included in some way. Mark, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Moving into question three. So I've put in bold the key areas and I, I believe they're now bolded in the form itself uh, and I need to check in the online portal because one of the suggestions we made that they are emphasised in that way. So question three is about working with the learners to focus on 21st century learning skills. If you're not familiar with those, we'll give you an introduction to them in a minute and there's loads of resources I'm about to give you links to, so you don't need to go away and find research on it. We'll hand it all to you and you can click the links in this slide deck, which will be in the team afterwards. But thinking about those 21st century learning skills, developing that transferable skill set using the Microsoft tools, not just within a specific subject, but it might be across the wider life of a student or a pupil or a member of staff. So you might show them OneNote and they've they've used OneNote for taking some meeting notes, but then they discover the tick boxes or the check boxes and they use that for tick lists. And it's another way of them keeping lists instead of using post-it notes. There's lots of ways that you can incorporate this in here. Microsoft have got a entire MEC pathway on this. So if you want to and you're logged into the Microsoft Education Center, you can pick up that learning pathway and it will take you through and I'll show you that in just a tick as well. 
The idea with the resources that I'm about to show you, there's a rubric on collaboration in 21st century learning skills, and it opens up in OneNote. So there's lots of sections and a huge number of pages within those sections. Take your time to read through, but what you don't need to do is reinvent the wheel. And we're not asking you to have used every single area of the 21st century learning skills, but by designing that learning and incorporating that into your planning and making sure that you're exposing either colleagues or pupils and students to those philosophies, that you've got that captured in your answer to question three. The MEC course itself, there's the learning pathway there. I've screenshotted it, including it for you. There'll be the link in the slide decks that you get afterwards. If you can't find it in the MEC by searching for it, you can just click that link there. And as long as you're logged into the MEC on your computer in a web browser, it will automatically take you to that on the, on the Microsoft Education Center. You can add it to your own training. You can either undertake the whole learning pathway or units of work there that might be courses or, that are of interest to you. You. It's up to you, uh, but you don't have to go and cover all of those in order to answer question three. You can very simply use the OneNote class notebook, which we are also going to give you a link to. You can take a copy yourself, so you can see there's a download your own copy link there. You just need to be signed into your Office 365 and then we'll ask to save a copy in your OneDrive. You can open it up in the OneNote in your Office 365 or you can have a read only version online. There's also a rubric uh, and there's a rubric there as it shows you around collaboration. So the sections down the left hand side refer to the 21st century learning design and skills and you need to include some reference to all of them in your answer to three. So we've got a, a, an expectation that you talk about collaboration. You talk about the skill of improving communication. That could be through using Teams as a platform. It could be that you've communicated effectively by using captioning or being able to share a transcript that you've taken out of Translator, which we showed you as well. So there's lots of ways of doing that. There are other ways about knowledge construction that can happen in many different forms. It might be that you've just made research more accessible. So you've used the Edge browser and you've used things like the immersive reader tool there so that they've been able to research and get information from a website by putting it into immersive reader. And then that's reduced the barrier. But they're accumulating knowledge and they're constructing that in different ways. It's then how you bring it together and the tools that you're going to use in Microsoft 365 to construct that knowledge. The self-regulation is a bit more far ranging and involves a bit more uh, a bit more time. But the self-regulation is using those those tools that you've got and also using those other schools from the pre previous rubrics that you've got there to think about how you regulate your own workload, how you manage, how you set realistic expectations for yourself let's put it that way to work through what you're facing be it a task in maths english or be it something you're professionally having to undertake and how you've captured the skills to work smartly and bring those workloads down and then the last rubric functions on problem solving this could be in some like minecraft education edition where we looked at jumping into a world I showed you an example of where I set a challenge for the students I was working with in the secondary school to build a bridge. We went away and we did some knowledge construction. We did the research uh, in standard form. We used books initially and then went into web browsers and then we built it and we solved the problems as we went along in Minecraft Education Edition. So it doesn't have to be that you just use the apps that are in the app launcher in Office 365. Think about those wider apps across the whole of Microsoft 365 that we've exposed you to in the course prior. So as far as answering that question, there's some examples there. So I've created a Minecraft World 2, and that would be using Minecraft Education Edition. If you missed that session, you can go back and watch the recording from that. We've also showed you how to use Forms, Streamline, either data collection, it could be classroom quizzes in Forms, Maybe that you're using videos and you've captured something. Uh, you've maybe used Stream or you've embedded it into PowerPoint or you've shared it in the stream of a, a team itself, whichever way you want to do it. Then it's linking out to other things. So it might be that you use Sway, but you might use other platforms. It asks you in section one, or sorry, phase one, what your background is and what other software you're using. So don't be shy about mentioning linked 
technologies that are relevant, but don't labor on them too much. But do mention that you've got a wider palette of software you use. But because this is an MIEE qualification from Microsoft, labor on explaining the use of the Microsoft, but, but make sure you've included any reference to it. Any questions around uh, question three? Question three is probably the biggest out of all of them. Yeah, Adobe Spark is fine to mention that. And you can say if you use Adobe Creative Suite, maybe you've got a subscription and yeah, you use Photoshop or any of the uh, any of the Adobe applications in that suite, or if you just subscribe to one specific application in there, maybe you use uh, uh, I want to say it's not Audacity. Can't remember the name of the of the video editing and the audio software there in Creative Suite, but um, yeah, audition. That's the one. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, you mentioned that you do use those in Premiere Pro for video editing. Yeah, you, can, you mentioned that you've got all of those. It might be that you you've edited the footage in Premiere Pro and then you've taken the finalized video and you've used it in a sway. Well, talk about that journey. Talk about the suite of tools that you've used in order to get to the video that you've got in the end or the audio that you've captured or the picture that you've modified in some way however you're doing it reference it get it in there you just need to be smart with your character limit so some people i know on question three have struggled struggled to get into the character limit because there's quite a bit you can talk about particularly with those different rubrics and all those different areas in the 21st century learning skills there's a lot to get in there. So that, if anything, this is the one that you have to edit down, I would say. Any other questions or anything else that anybody wants to share around question three before I move into question four? OK, I'll keep going. So question four itself is where you need to give an example of a learning artifact. And I'll explain in a bit more detail about the what the artifact is. Uh, it wants to be something that you've got tangible evidence for of the outcome from it. So you need to link this to something that is a sequence in learning that you're delivering for pupils or students or adults, because we've said as well, it's perfectly valid if you're working with, uh, with adults there. Again, talk about the tools that you've used. There's so much here that you could use, but presentation tools are a strong th theme here. PowerPoints and sways. But again, if you've used some other sort of presentation tool, it could be that you're using Adobe Spark. Mention it in there. It's not a limiting factor that you've used something else other than Microsoft, but do go into more depth again with the uh, with the Microsoft element. Also, if you've used, uh, if you've had to use multiple browsers and you use things like uh, in private browsing or incognito, talk about all those different things to be able to run different platforms. If you logged into Adobe in one, or dare I use the dirty word Google uh, in another and Microsoft in another, talk about how you've done that and it's all in there too. So you're demonstrating how you have reached the desired outcomes for the learning objectives. Talk about the success criteria that you've used in the journey. Talk about how you may have used one or multiple Microsoft tools to get there, but get that explained succinctly and concisely. So you might talk about how you showcase something in a sway. You might talk about that you've given pupils the task of making a presentation in a sway. It might be that you've used a sway to pull all the information together for, uh, for a pupil or a student to get it there in one place. You could have shared it in Teams. You might have shared it in the video. You might have distributed it in another way. Talk about how you've got that out there. The video, talk about how you've instructed someone. Talk about embedding media into the sway. So it's really important there to mention things like photo stacks. Uh, and if you've edited those in Adobe, mention it. If you've uh, created videos and you've got them in there, but don't overlook Flipgrid here. Flipgrid and getting Flipgrid responses. You as the teacher, if you've created a Flipgrid uh, and people have made responses in there, be it adults, it could be staff to catch their opinion on something. It might be the students. It could be, I've got some schools starting to use Flipgrid to capture leavers videos. So they've used that to capture snapshots. Uh, and then those videos have been put into a sway afterwards because you as the owner can get the videos out of the Flipgrid, although you might have blocked it for the students. So there's different ways that you can do it there. Uh, and I've got one school that's using a sway to create a lever sway and the videos they've captured from Flipgrid are going into that sway and then they're managing the restrictions in the sway so that they're making sure that the content 
isn't lost by the school and their GDPR compliant and so forth. But presentations are a key example there to include in question five. Anything else on question five? Anybody want to share any insights of anything they've got so far in their application if they've already started working on this? No. Right, we'll keep going on to question six. We are nearly there for people that are working with us on this one. Uh, question six being the final question of the phase three section. So in question six, you're looking for two really good examples about how you supported your own learning growth and development and that of colleagues. So this is where you're showing that MIE philosophy and mindset that you are a digital leader in your school or the establishment that you work in, and you are going to bring about change and drive that change. You're going to be a catalyst for it, either convincing leadership teams or working through middle leadership or showcasing it with a group of colleagues and then taking that forward to show how there could be no argument against using this technology but you need to demonstrate it really clearly and if you haven't done it yet and it's just a plan talk about that plan if you can do anything to even begin bringing any of those planned items into reality by the time you get your application and then do it we've got a bit of time left in the summer term although i know the summer term does get busy because you're trying to cram in everything that we missed during lockdown but also it's naturally a busy term anyway with everything else that's going on in schools so it's really key that you reference the learning pathways or the courses that you've undertaken in the MEC here and make sure that you explain how they've impacted on your knowledge to go away and influence and bring about change in others or work with them to support them about specific needs. Maybe they came to you. They said, look, I just don't know what to do. Or do you know of a technology that we can use to do X, Y, and Z? And you've gone, oh, yeah, of course I do. Uh, and you go uh, and you help them. However you've done it, whether it was research outside the MEC, uh, talk about it and then talk about the success that you've had of working with others. It could be that something you've learned from a course that you've attended. It could be one of the sessions that you come to for the turn on MIEE program. If you have run sections in staff meetings, you've contributed to other groups, you've gone to a conference and spoken, even virtually, you've been sharing something on social media, you've been tweeting, you've been using LinkedIn, maybe you've responded and talked to someone like Mike Tholson or something on that he shared, use it all as evidence, show that you're you're working within communities, you're influencing others, you're starting to network. That's what this section's all about. And if you've got any formal certifications and qualifications, maybe your Microsoft MCE or an MOS, if you've got any other qualifications for Microsoft, include it in there. You don't need to mention that you're a certified MIE. It's a given that you've got to this point by becoming a certified MIE and doing a thousand points in the Microsoft Education Centers. Don't mention that. But if you've got anything else, any other professional qualifications that are relevant to the digital world, pop them in there. It shows to them that you are somebody who's interested in developing yourself and potentially then using that oh, your own professional development to help and influence others. So question six is all about that transformation of yourself, but also the transformation you're going to bring about in your education institution and with the others that you can immediately influence. That one can sometimes be the trickiest to include a answer on. And if you haven't done it yet, as I said, outline your plan. What are your intentions? What do you want to do? And get that in as your answer to question six. Anything around question six that you want to discuss now? Marcus, you got in that? Uh, yeah, so if you got the level three virtual teachers award, do mention that in there. Talk about that. Talk about how you can bring about any of the any of the elements that you've learned from that and how you've maybe brought them to bear and things you're doing now, how that might transfer across to the aspirations to be an MIEE as well. Pull on everything you've got as a professional. And I know we've got so many skills, a huge amount of knowledge that we amass. We don't always get a chance to demonstrate that. One thing I would say in all of these questions in the phase three section is don't be shy. Don't waffle but be concise in what you're saying, but don't be worried about 
demonstrating and being loud and proud about what you've done and how you've brought about that change and how you've brought that transformation either in your own practice or the practice of others because that's what they're looking for when they mark these six questions in phase three they want the evidence to slap them in the face but keep it to what I've got as the bullet points on this slide deck and you'll have this slide deck to refer to it should be clear from the either the portal if you're filling it in directly or the self-nomination word document but what i wanted to do in today's session is spell out in more detail so you've got no doubt whatsoever about what you should be discussing in each of these questions in phase one phase two and phase three and phase three is where these six questions sit mark i guess you've got something else going now okay so um definitely include that as well that you work in a college where the college is in, is invested in the development the professional development of their staff and that you being on this and wanting to get the MIEE qualifications just even more evidence about the fact that you want to broaden it you haven't just settled for getting the level three virtual teacher award that you are now wanting to amass another qualification and not to keep it to yourself you want to better yourself, but also you want to uh, share that good practice with others. Uh, great, I consider it. You know, it absolutely is enough to apply, Mark. Uh, in It's just making the most of what you've done so far. Big it up. Uh, talk about it in, in however much depth you can, uh, but make sure you include every last detail. And as I've said with the question six, even if you've seen something through joining these sessions or you've read something on social media or you've seen something demonstrated in another community or someone else discuss it, and you've got intentions to use it, talk about that as well. That is enough to apply. You don't have to worry about having to tick something on every one of those bullet points that I've shown you in the, in the guidance I've given you today. Always include as much as you can, but it afterwards, even if it's just saying, I intend to use this aspect of immersive reader, or I know we've got a, a group of colleagues which uh, have English as a secondary or third language, and I think it would help them to use translator. However you want to do it, talk about intentions of use as well as what you've actually done. That will absolutely be enough to apply. Moving through. So the step three, step three, just to recap, it's confusing that Microsoft have, have used the steps and phases. So step one was to sign up for the MEC. Step two was to get your thousand points and become a certified MIE. And then step three was to do your application. Your application now has three phases. Phase one is about you. That's the background information. Doesn't count against you. It's not weighted in your application anyway. Phase two is the machine learning marked answer to questions. It's about using the technologies that we've shown you, also about the features within those technologies. And then phase three are the six questions that we've just been through. So phase one, two and three is all bundled up in step three. So the self-nomination form, whether you choose to use it or not, is there. It's up to you whether you want to. It won't go against you if you haven't fleshed out your answers in there. Microsoft have got no way of checking whatsoever. So if you want to go straight to the online platform, the applications can be saved partially. It excludes the noise going on outside of my window. They can be saved partially. and You can come back to them at a later date. It's not like you've got to do everything in one go. You don't lose it. So your progress is locked in and you can go back in. So you will, when you start your application, need to create an online account. And that is going to be your area to make your application. Uh, and it will want to emphasize that applications can be used by joint projects. So if you've delivered something in partnership with a colleague or in partnership with another school or organization, maybe you've hooked up with somebody who's like minded on a community and you've done something with them there. It's absolutely fine for both of you to use it. If you're coming from a school or a college here today, and you know you've both taken a project and you want to both use it as evidence for your individual MIEE applications, you can do that. There's no problem with that. In fact, Microsoft are going to be pleased to see that you've worked with a colleague and you've collaborated together. Reasons for unsuccessful nominations. 
they were couched originally in the Sway applications from last year. But Jen uh, and the Microsoft team have very clearly explained this is something that's still relevant, particularly for the six questions in phase three. So you need to make sure that you do have some sort of answer, at least 500 characters for each of the questions at the six questions. The other thing is not giving the evidence that's required for those six questions. We've gone through today really clearly the areas you need to cover to evidence your answers for those six questions. Make sure you stick to that. A bit like you talk to students at GCSEs, make sure that you, you focus on these areas. This is what the exam board will be expecting. Stick to the evidence that Microsoft wants to see and make sure that you give it, even if it's you intend to use it and you haven't used it yet, get it mentioned and get it in there. Doesn't matter if you haven't had a chance to do everything. Only using texts in a, in, a, in a basic form is something that is OK in some contexts, but make sure you talk about how you want to use it further. If you've done something in an in, in a, in a innovative way, if I can talk this afternoon, then make sure that you mention that in there. If you think it's a bit left field and quirky and you're not quite sure whether you should mention it, absolutely you should. I think one of the things that makes it, it better to read the answers is to find someone's imaginative and creative way of bending a technology and using it for another purpose. So get it in there. If you've been imaginative what you're doing, include it in there. Talk, if, particularly in question six, if people talk just about their own practice in their own classroom, it won't be enough. Question six is absolutely designed for you to talk and demonstrate how you will work beyond your own classroom or how you have worked beyond your own classroom. And not talking about that means that you're in a smaller mindset and being an MIE is being part of a bigger community. It's being open to working with others, connecting with others, getting help back and giving help out. And that's something that needs to come across very clearly. And you can sprinkle it through questions one to five, but it needs to be absolutely crystal clear in question six. And for people that are returning MIEs, Talk about your evidence in question one, if that's relevant for you. If you're not returning MIEE, don't worry about that in question one. I have got here lots of links to resources that you're going to need to visit, and they are resources that we've woven through all of the previous Turn It On MIEE sessions, but I've pulled them together in one slide deck to make it easier for you instead of having to go and delve through all those other decks that we've shared previously. So Microsoft Education Centre, hopefully you're well frequented with it, but the links are there anyway. So we're just popping back. Accessibility Checker is something you need to discuss for question two or three. Uh, and Accessibility Checker is built into various uh, Office 365 applications, but there's some information there about that. Then talk about Flipgrid, make sure you mention Flipgrid at least once. It needs to go in there. Talking about how you're using Teams, do include Minecraft Education Edition. That's why I've exposed you to it. Talk about how you've used the Edge browser, even if not your primary browser. Talk about it. As a tip for you, talk about how you've used the immersive reader button, which is in the address bar to the right hand side. And you've maybe used that for part of the 21st century learning skills about accessing knowledge or amassing knowledge or doing research. Uh, have that discussion in there about how you may have used the edge, but even if you just experimented with it and you've despised it in the past and you've just had a go, it's what it does. Talk about that. Make sure it's in there. Obviously, we've got 21st century learning design, 21st century learning skills that needs to come across really clearly in the question about it. We've given you the links to the rubrics. We've given you the links to the OneNote. They're there again. You can take your own copy. You can get stuck into that and have a good read. But you need to make sure that you visit all of those areas in those different rubrics in there and include them and mention at least one reference in that response to the question. If you can get in anything about make code, so make code if you're not someone who teaches the coding curriculum, it could be that you've just gone on and you've used a micro bit or you've had a go at it using script based learning. Make code is also in the coding element of Minecraft Education Edition. So if you press C and go into Code Builder when you're using Minecraft Education Edition, 
and I showed you very quickly how to drop in block based coding to make your avatar in Minecraft Education Edition to do things like building a wall. That is make code. If you have even just press the C and dropped a um, dropped a series of blocks together and you've got your avatar to lay a couple of blocks. There you go. There's your evidence. Talk about it. You don't have to go and use make code discreetly. You've got something to include, but it's within Minecraft Education Edition. Hacking STEM can sometimes be more of a difficult one to include. But if you've got any sort of STEM link to the subjects that you teach, or maybe you've helped a colleague that's within a STEM subject, or you've just made them aware of hacking STEM, hacking STEM are activities that make students focus on the STEM subjects. It gives them challenges, problems to solve, and it gives, uh, gives teachers a lot of resources in order to do that. That's something there. Microsoft Imagine Academy gives students and educators lots of certifications to undertake, courses to work on. It's a bit like a version of the MEC for them. Uh, so you might want to direct students to it. You might want to direct colleagues to it. It's up to you. But all of those links to those resources to incorporate into the questions, particularly those longer answer questions, are all there. The timeline hasn't changed. It's still the same timeline, even before Microsoft decided to shake up the application structure. It's going to be applications did open on the 6th of May in the new structure and form. They will close on the 15th. To remind you from what I said at the beginning of this, if you decide to submit your application on the 8th and it detects your answers in the phase two, the machine learning answer questions are incorrect and you don't hit the 70% threshold, then it will direct you to go back and have another go and reconsider those answers. We are around, though we've we've got courses concluding, we're around in the community. So if you are struggling with your application, you're not sure about something in your MIE application, we aren't going to vanish. We are always checking that. I've got my notifications on. The minute somebody, someone mentions something or asks a question, I will do my best. If I'm not in another meeting or a training session, I will pop in and do my best to help you. Also help each other. And then one of the things that people found really beneficial last year at this point they started throwing in their equivalent of the self-nomination forms which were the sways last year they showed it they they talked about the way they were structuring their answers as a community help each other it's part of the mieE mindset to work together and not suffer in silence or try and reinvent the wheel I know loads of people saved time last year just by taking lots of ideas or answers or, or partial bits from other people's evidence and then twisting it and adding in their own touch of what they were doing in their own practice. Your announcement of whether you're successful in passing your application after July 15th, you won't hear anything for a bit, but around the end of August, hopefully in the last week of August, uh, that is yet to be a finalised date. So 30th is a bit up in the air, but it will be the last week of August. Microsoft will then make the announcement and the people that are successful will be announced. You'll get an email and you'll get a link to get your certificate and your badge, but you'll also get included on the MIEE web page if you've been successful in your application. Some people asked me privately, well, what happens if I'm not successful this time round? Well, all is not lost. Don't worry. The July the 15th is what we're aiming for here, but you don't have to worry if maybe you haven't got enough time or if you weren't quite sure if it, you've got everything in the way that you wanted to or you want to improve upon it because you weren't successful at the end of August. There will be a second round of MIEE applications to mop up people that didn't get passed on July the 15th. And you can resubmit in another round on the 15th from the 15th of November to January the 16th, 2022. And then the idea of that is that not really to encourage new people because that will come in July 2022, but really for anyone that now isn't successful in this round, they've got a second bite of the cherry and they can go at it again that time. So if you aren't successful in July or August this time, all is not lost. You've got a second go at things and you can then resubmit your application there. It will be a blank sheet of paper. It will be taken as a new application and nothing you've done previously or answers that you submitted previously will be held against you. You can just put in a fresh application. I know a few people were concerned about that and they were questioning just how that was going to work. Well, you do have a second go at it. Any questions relating to anything we've covered there?
No. As always, we are here to help you turn it on. You've got us supporting you in the MIEE team, which you're all enrolled into, and that's also where you will find the resources. I will make an announcement in there later, and I will link it to the files in the files section where you can go and pick up the slide deck today with all the links that I've shown you, and you can just cross-reference the areas that I've told you to include in your, particularly your long answers for those six questions. But if there's anything else you want to work with on Turn It On as well, you can always get in contact with us. You can either drop me a message in the chat or you can email into office at Turn It On and then it will get directed through to myself or Tiana, who's been working as part of the marketing team throughout this programme. So really, I'm going to throw it open at this point. Is there anything else that you want to ask about the MIE application process? I appreciate we've already been here for an hour. I will stay for as many questions as are necessary, but also I don't want to hold you here if you need to go and do other things. At this point, I'm also going to stop the recording for anyone listening to the recording, but if there's anything else relevant, I will include it in the team later. <laughs>